You have entered the command zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. How's it, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Command Zone podcast. I'm your host, Josh Lee Kwai. I'm sitting here with Jamie Block. Jamie, Hello. you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I am Jamie Block. I am a writer here at the Command Zone. Uh, you might know my work if you are a Command Zone fan from a lot of our ads and some of our recent special projects. I also used to be a writer on the show Fresh Off the Boat, so maybe you know my words from there. Yeah, Jamie, uh, very good with words. One of the people responsible for a lot of the funny stuff we do here at the Command Zone, but also a very big Commander player. Uh, everybody here at the Command Zone kind of is. So Jamie took the lead on this, what's it called, Maestro's Massacre pre-con deck from Streets of New Capenna. This is what we would formerly have called Grixis. Yes. And it is a spell slinger pre-con? Yes. It certainly is a spell slinger commander, and you will sling a few spells along the way. Yeah. Um, there's that new uh, mechanic, which is casualty. So we'll explain it in a second here, but it's, it makes it, I think it's a, a different twist on this, the spell slinger thing. Yes, it's interesting. It wants you to have creatures. It also wants you to be slinging spells. It pulls you a bit in two directions in a way that I think is fun, but is also a bit of a challenge. Uh, so we're going to do the normal thing, which is we're going to go over the statistics, the stats of the deck, and then Jamie has assembled the 10 cards that he's going to suggest you add to this deck and the 10 to take out for $30 or less to sort of get this up to speed and ready to tangle with quote-unquote real decks as quickly as possible. But first, before we get into it, if you're going to want to upgrade this deck, well, you are going to have to purchase it. And the best place to buy all of your sealed product for Magic the Gathering is channelfireball.com slash command. That's the place to go to buy all your Magic product singles, anything at all. Streets of New Capenna, right around the corner. Um, at the time you're watching this, I think these decks have been just recently revealed. They all look pretty sweet. If you do what I do, you're going to get your hands on all of them. And uh, Channel Fireball really does have the best prices on sealed products because they're the marketplace in Magic where they only allow licensed professional businesses to be vendors on their marketplace. So everybody you're buying from is an LGS. They are a real store owner. It's not just somebody selling cards out of their basement. And as a result, uh, they get really good prices on the sealed product because they're all going from the distributors and they have to compete with each other so i found it a really good place to go to get your draft boosters your set boosters your collector's boosters commander precon stuff like that again channelfireball.com slash command or you can put in the code command at checkout and then of course once you get your hands on the cards they are valuable you don't want them to get messed up or anything ultra pro makes the products that jimmy and i trust our own collections to we have big collections we have expensive cards you've seen us play them on game nights and extra turns and things like that we don't want them to get dinged up Ultra Pro makes Eclipse Sleeves to keep everything safe. They make awesome deck boxes, Satin Towers, Mythic Collection stuff. They also make a bunch of other accoutrements that can like adorn your gamer cave or your game den, right? They have wall scrolls. They have uh, all the, the artwork from the official Magic sets. They get the IP for that so they can put it on all their stuff. So really, if you want your battlefield to look cool and your game pieces to be protected, there's nobody that does it better than Ultra Pro. And of course, the final way to support all of our content is directly if you go to patreon.com slash command zone. You can join our community. We've recently upgraded our entire Patreon. There's all kinds of new cool stuff. We're going to start being uh, able to play spell table games with our patrons in May. We're going to start to post a schedule where Jimmy, myself, members of our team will be there each and every week playing uh, games over spell table with our patrons. There's all kinds of other stuff going on. Patreon.com slash command is where you join that. And of course, another perk of being a patron is we shout out one lucky uh, patron member every single episode. And this episode is dedicated to Zach Duren. 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 It's probably one of the things we just said. Now, I say, I, whenever I'm in doubt, I just say it three or four different ways. And Zach, I hope I got one of them right. But Zach, don't forget, you rock. you rock. Yeah, you are an awesome patron. Thanks so much for supporting us. Uh, one, thing bef one more thing before we get into this. Uh, Command Zone Live is coming on April 20th. At the time we're recording this, that'll either be right, bef right after you're watching this, or maybe it already happens. But the good news is if you miss April 20th, you should be there when it's live, because... Uh, 
we're gonna we're able to like interact with the chat which is not something we can do normally on our podcast and that means that the people that are there watching it live get to join the discussion we're uh, we've got a special guest well it's it's not a secret at this point it's post malone we're going to be talking about the new commander cards outside of the pre-cons just which ones we think are the best in the format and uh, again that's april 20th if you want to join us if it's already happened when you're watching this don't worry we will upload it as a, a, a vod on our normal channel so you can catch that probably pretty soon okay Let's get into this deck. Maestro's Massacre, pre-con budget upgrade guide. Again, the rules are we're going to add 10 cards to this de deck, take 10 cards out for a total budget of $30. We're going to leave the mana base as is. We say this every time, but for the most part, the mana base and the pre-cons will work, and it's not fun to say, hey, if you got shocks and fetches, put them in there. Not super interesting. We want to change the meat of the deck. Um, but of course, if you got shocks and fetches, put them in there. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the new commanders first. We're going to break down kind of where the deck is when it's right out of the box, so then we can sort of inform or contextualize our decisions for what cards to add uh, when we get into that part later. So the, the face commander on the deck is... How do you pronounce it? An, I'm saying Angelo. Angelo, the painter. He costs Grixis, so blue, black, and red, three mana total, for a 1-3 vampire assassin with death touch says the first instant or sorcery spell you cast each turn has casualty two. What this means is as you cast that spell, you may sacrifice a creature with power two or greater. When you do, copy the spell and you may choose new targets for the copy. So this is that casualty mechanic new to Streets of New Capenna that we were talking about earlier. In other terms, if you were to cast lightning bolts and when you cast it, Casualty triggers, you sacrifice a creature with power two or greater, you would get a second lightning bolt, a copy of lightning bolt that you could point at something else. So you kind of get two lightning bolts at the cost of sacrificing that creature. Yes, and an important thing to note right away, just because a lot of the cards that trigger off casting instants and sorceries, there are a lot that make 1-1 one -one tokens. This doesn't work like crew. You cannot sacrifice two creatures with power one to add up to two. It's one single creature with power uh, greater than or equal to the number that it needs, in this case two. So that's just a thing to keep in mind if you are tinkering with your own builds of this commander. Uh, remember that casualty two means a creature with power two or greater. Right, and you also cannot sacrifice two creatures with power two or greater to get an extra two copies, right? You can only make one copy. It's not like even one copy per thing you sacrifice. You can only co you can only sacrifice one thing. You don't have the option to sacrifice another. Exactly. Uh, pretty interesting. Copying spells, as we know, is very powerful. I gave a bad example, I think, there, because you probably don't want to be sacrificing a two drop to copy a one mana spell. Maybe. Uh, but becomes exponentially more powerful if you're talking about Sublime Epiphany or something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, just... If you're building this deck right, if you are trying to get the most out of that ability, really think about your instant and sorcery base as, what if I could copy every spell? What are the spells that I would want to copy? Uh, some of them are going to be big and splashy. Some of them are going to be more value, early game, low to the ground type stuff. But yeah, it really runs the gamut. Lightning Bolt maybe doesn't make the cut, but uh, there are a lot of great options there, big and small, depending on how you want to do it. Yeah, and of course, there are things that are good to copy and things that are not good to copy. Like board wipes, not great to copy because you already wiped the board. The second copy of it won't do much, right? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Sublime Epiphany, actually, and uh, other modal cards that uh, have countering a spell as one of the modes. When you copy a modal spell, you get to choose new targets, but not new modes. So sometimes you can actually kind of create a situation that doesn't work the way you wanted it to when you have to choose a target for the copy of counter target spell. Well, you can always counter the same target that you targeted with the first copy because the first one yes. won't have resolved yet. But yes, you have to be careful of things like that. Yes, you have to make sure that one of your other modes has targets so you don't accidentally fizzle mm. your other copy of the spell. Oh, good point, good point. Uh, okay, so on Halo seems pretty powerful. Yeah, no. Copying this... spells is, is not no joke. Yeah, if, like I was saying earlier, this commander was just Grixis for a 1-3 that said copy the first spell you cast each turn. It'd be person. nuts. Exactly. So, and this is, we're trying to do sort of that, right? Yeah, we're trying to get there. And obviously you have to jump through more hoops to get there. But no, that's the, uh, that's the dream with this commander. And it is a dream that is not inconceivable. Well, and we know a lot of instances of sorceries do something and create 
uh, little creatures at the same time a lot of times. So yeah. you can be creating the creatures with the spells that you're copying that you can sacrifice later to copy other spells. That seems like it's probably going to be a good strategy. We always like to look at the secondary commander, uh, and sometimes there's a, there's a third commander in the deck. In these decks for New Capenna, there's only um, sort of a backup singer, and then there's a third legendary creature, but it only has two of the colors, not three, so you couldn't run it out of the box. But there have been times in the past where, and Shorakai is a good example just from the last set. Katori's on the box, but Shorakai is the commander we suggest that you run out of the box if you're trying to make the deck sort of play as smooth and be as powerful as possible. So it's not always a given that the face commander will be what we want to run. So let's look at the backup commander here in the uh, Maestro Massacre deck. It's Parnesi. Parnes. Parnes. It's it's really a question of if we are, um, and, and this was for Zach Dureni. Or Doreen. It's the same question. Do we pronounce the E at the end of these names? I am treating every word like it's French today. <laughs> I don't know why I'm doing that when it's maestros, but... Uh, I would think it would Arnest. be Italian, right? That I see why you're saying that, <laughs> but for some reason, I am defaulting to French, and I'm going to stick with it. Okay, well, par Parnes or Parnese, the subtle brush... Two blue, black, red, five mana for a 4-4 four, four vampire wizard. Whenever you or a permanent you control becomes the target of a spell or ability an opponent controls, counter that spell or ability unless that player pays four life. And it also says whenever you copy a spell, up to one target opponent may also copy that spell. They may choose new targets for the copy. Wow, I did not expect that second part. So the first is like a bad ward. They can pay four life. They probably will because they know that this is out there when they cast their thing. But it'll, you know, that's not nothing. Yeah, four isn't nothing. There are certain strategies that this really hoses, but for the most part, it's just going to do a little bit of damage to people over time. It's not going to be a big splashy effect on the game. Yeah, it's just slightly annoying. The second one, whenever you copy a spell, one of your opponents, you can let them copy that spell, and they get to choose their own targets for it. An interesting sort of group huggy thing, I guess? Yeah, I think of it as very political. I think if you're looking to do politics and Grixis, which feel like fun colors to do that in, this is a great option. You can. It's very much about making deals with people. If I give you a copy of the spell, what are you going to target with it? Will you target this? If you do, I'll make this other thing happen for you. It's uh, One tricky thing, though, is if you want to build a political deck, there are a lot of cards that sort of you might be interested in, but you really need to be copying spells. So. Yeah, you, oh, that's true, because uh, Parnisi does not copy any spells on her own. You need to be copying them in other ways before you're even doing that second part of the text. Exactly. So it can pull you in the direction of, I want to copy spells, but also I want to play fun political cards. Uh, you're probably, I mean, if you're playing her, you need to be going in the copying spells direction, or else you're just really not getting value out of half the card. I think it's very fun and interesting. I would enjoy playing at a pod that had this deck in it, because a lot of fun politics are going to happen. But it does seem like you have to jump through some hurdles to make the commander sort of shine. Yeah, spoiler alert, it's unlikely that this deck is going to be set up so that uh, Parnese, Parnes, Parnesi, whatever, is better as a commander than Anhelo would be. Yeah, that said, with Anhelo as your commander... You would uh, be happy to draw. Absolutely. Parnese, yeah. Having all of your spells read not only when you cast this copy it and give a copy to another player only if you want to... Seems pretty fun. Yeah, you can make those deals where, again, I'll use Lightning Bolt, not in the deck, but uh, cast my Lightning Bolt, copy it with the casualty thing, and be like, hey, uh, you know, Mel, if I give you a Lightning Bolt, what would you target with it? And she goes, that thing on Jimmy's board. Well, in that case, Mel, have a Lightning Bolt. Yeah, it's great. It also sets up other people to betray you. <laughs> Because you can always ask, what are you going to target with it? Then give them the copy, and then they choose something That's else. That's the most Jamie thing that I've ever heard. <laughs> All right. The the, uh, the commander, or sorry, the legendary creature that you cannot run as the commander out of the box because there's only two colors is Cyrix, Carrier of the Flame. It's two, a black, and a red for a 3-3 three, three Phoenix with Flying Haste. It says, at the beginning of each end step, if a creature card left your graveyard this turn, target Phoenix you control deals damage equal to its power to any target. And then it says, whenever another Phoenix you control dies... You may cast Cyrix, Carrier of the Flame, from your graveyard. Phoenix is always coming back from the graveyard, as we know. Sort of Phoenix tribal, but you made an interesting point in the notes here that, like, this might just be better as a deck if you're just trying to have creature cards leave your graveyard and then maybe just somehow pumping Cyrix so that it is large enough. And then you're just like, 
Yeah, maybe you're um, just using some graveyard hate on yourself even would do it, right? Yeah, exiling a card from your own graveyard every turn. I think it has to be a creature card, but still right. you can pull that off. Uh, cards like Reassembling Skeleton and some sort of shenanigans to keep getting it in and out of the yard. Mm. And yeah, either giving, either pumping up the commander or giving it Death Touch so when it deals damage to any target, you can ping down one creature Guilty. each mm. turn. Uh, there's it's only once per turn, right? So it doesn't matter how many times you do Reassembling Skeleton. It really will only activate once on the end step to have Syrix deal its power to a thing. Yes, but at least it is each turn. It's not yeah. only your own. So if you've if you've really assembled whatever engine you've put in this deck, you can be doing, you know, on face value, 12 damage over the course of a turn cycle. And if you've pumped it up or done other, done other shenanigans, maybe more than that. Give it uh, Infect, maybe. Give it a sword of something. And then, boom, it's two shots. Exactly. That's uh, That sounds cool, actually. But can't do it in this deck because it's only two colors. Right. Okay, let's talk about the... <laughs> Stats, 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 stats. The foundational stats of Maestro's Massacre, you want to read them? Sure. So ramp, we have eight cards. That is lower than I would like it to be. Yeah, I think lower by a decent amount now. It used to be one around 10. Now we're closer to 12 or 13. So this is maybe two thirds of the amount of ramp we would have uh, or we would want. So I think we're low. Yeah, we are low. That's just sort of the way it is. I kind of get it from a, you need room for spells, but it's not ideal. Uh, card draw, we have 11. We still like around 10 card draw spells, so that's nice. Yeah, no, that number is pretty good. Uh, a lot of it skews more expensive, but it's in there. It's good. Gotta have it. Uh, next is single target removal. 11. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Uh, that, that's often uh, sort of... Not higher than you want, but on the high end of what you want. But you like to have it. Yeah, I think in casual, I like around, again, 12 to, to 13, maybe 14. This is pretty close. Um, it's going to allow you to interact. You definitely won't be stuck being like, I can never touch my opponent's stuff. Mm -hmm. And the next one, category is board wipes. Where we have four. Which I think is good. Actually, maybe a little high even. Like these days, I'm like three board wipes, sometimes two. Yeah. Now, and some of them are conditional. Some of them won't always end up being mm. a full board wipe, but still you have four cards that certainly could wipe the board. Uh, that's pretty good. Okay. Let's talk about sort of the deck uh, specific yes. stats. These are the things that are going to go along with the strategies of our commander cards. So we have sort of a category of graveyard synergy, and this can be a few things. It could be spells with flashback. It could be things that come back from the yard, which if you're sacrificing something for casualty and then you get it back from the yard so you can sacrifice it again, that's very important with the strategy of the deck. And just other cards that in some way function from your graveyard, which again, when you're sending things there by casting them or sacrificing them, is important to have. So there's 20 graveyard synergy cards. Yes. Uh, casualty slash spell copy cards. There are eight of those. So that is a card that either has casualty or in some other way copies your spells. Uh, then token cards, so cards that create tokens, which I assume means cards that create fodder that you can sacrifice to the casualty. Mm -hmm. There are nine of those. It seems a little low. Um, doesn't seem like I maybe I will have enough creatures lying around if that's the case. I guess some of the graveyard synergy cards fill in for that too, though. Yeah, there's definitely some early fodder in non-token form in the uh, deck out of the box. Uh, but it is a thing where some of these token cards, uh, you certainly aren't going to have them early because they maybe cost eight. I guess in a worst case scenario, I would rather have instants and sorceries I can cast. And even if I don't do the casualty thing and copy them, uh, they still do their own thing than like a, too many tokens because my deck's not really focused around like pumping all my tokens probably since I'm going to be sacrificing them. Right. So you don't, the thing you don't want to do is edge towards creating too much fodder, in which case that's all you're doing and you're not doing the copy of spells. So mm -hmm. um, speaking of instants and sorceries, there are seven support cards or payoff cards for instants and sorceries. And then the total amount of instants and sorceries in the deck is 31. So it's definitely a spell slingers deck. We see this in almost all decks now where if you have a theme, you're going to have 25 plus of that card type or that tribe mm -hmm. or whatever. And this falls, you know, in that range on the high side, honestly, like that's a lot of instances of sorceries, which is cool. Um, so I think it's, it looks like the deck is definitely like on halo focused, right? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about the deck value 
one of everybody's favorite parts of all of these episodes, which is, I must note, uh, that the prices we're about to talk about were taken prior to the deck being revealed, because we are recording this ahead of time so that we can uh, get all this content out to you on time. We do this for every deck for the last few years, so when we compare our deck prices to our previous deck prices, they're all being compared in the same way, apples to apples. So the total reprint value of the Maestro's Massacre deck. Remember, this is only taking into account reprints, not new cards, which we don't know the prices of yet. There are 63 reprints in the deck. Total reprint value, $81.77. Which is, like, average. Yeah, it is very close to the exact average, uh, which is not bad. But, notably, this is the lowest value among the pre-cons in this batch, which, you know, I mean, honestly, if this one's at average, that just sort of speaks highly to the, the reprint value of some of the other ones. I suppose so. I would like to see it over 90, you know. Obviously, we do get ones that are over 100 in reprint value. That's always nice. So this, even though it's average, it seems a little low because that average is being skewed by some of the $55 That's one from before, which I guess this looks a lot better in comparison to. Seems, I, I'd say this feels a little on the low side, even though it is average, but it's still acceptable, right? This is not something to get mad about, I don't think. Yeah, Absolutely. If you are seeing this at a time that you have somehow already purchased the deck, uh, don't feel bad. Well, I think also, like, it doesn't take into account the new cards. So it's definitely total value is going to be a lot more than this because new cards tend to be, you know, worth a decent amount. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, notable reprints. There are two cards that are $5 or more. They are Lightning Greaves, 8 bucks, and Cascade Bluffs, $7.83. $8 also, basically. Yeah. Um, that's it. Those are the only cards over... Five dollars, and I, I can every time I see Lightning Greaves, I think they've reprinted this so many times, and it's still always like you know fairly spendy. Yeah, absolutely. Good card, good card. You want it in this deck, and you want yeah. it in a lot of decks. I think is the, is the thing. Exactly. Um, okay, there are thirteen cards that are two dollars or more. The two five dollar cards, and then eleven more. Uh, I guess I'll read them. Just so that I'm not going to read what each of them does or anything. So, Ride of the Raging Storm, four dollars and fifty cents, four fifty six. Demir Signet, four twenty four. Clone Legion, three forty seven. Twinning Staff, three dollars and twenty nine cents. Mystic Confluence, I like this one a lot, three dollars and twenty one cents. I remember when that was a twenty something dollar card. So they've reprinted that enough that it's come down a lot, and I love that card. By the way, you're not you're not bouncing targets enough with that card. A, a lot of time, the right move is bounce three things. It's mm -hmm. just like I spent five mana, you all lost twenty mana. Um, Puppeteer click three dollars and nineteen cents. Ponder two fifty one. Kess dissident mage two dollars and forty nine cents. Felwar stone you can never have too many Felwar stones. It's kind of like arcane signet uh, two dollars and forty nine cents. Wayfarer's bobble. Mitch's favorite. Is it still Mitch's favorite? Was Mitch's favorite. $2.44. And then Rekindling Phoenix, $2. And nothing super exciting in there. I guess a Signet, a Felwar Stones. There's Felwar Stone, I think. Uh, um, I don't know if it's in all of them, but it was in the last deck. Well, the last deck we recorded. We might release these in different orders. But anyway, mm -hmm. Felwar Stones is the type of card that I play in almost every deck now. So I like seeing them continue to reprint that because it could easily go up over time if they don't. Yeah, there are no cards on this list that make you say, thank goodness they've re reprinted this, but it's a solid list. It's a solid list of uh, reprints that you always want to see. There's a number uh, of cards in there that you will use, right? Demir Signet, Mystic Confluence, Ponder, Felwar Stone, Wayfarer's Bobble, Lightning Greaves. Actually, I'd say a lot of these are usable in many decks. Yeah, these are cards that are sort of not flashy, but uh, have gotten to the price that they're at because they are so versatile. So it's always good to have more of them. Um, okay, I guess we always ask this question. We've already kind of answered it, but based on all the stats and everything we see, who should we run as the commander of the deck? I have chosen Angelo to be the commander of this deck. Are you surprised? <laughs> yeah, it just seems like the deck's probably more built for it. It's less gimmicky, uh, not group huggier in any way, and more straightforward, right, with what it wants to do. Yeah, it's a simple, powerful effect. It's not making you jump through weird hoops to do a gimmick. It's it's also just, I think, it is my personal favorite of, uh, I think, any of the commanders who can be your commander for any of the pre-cons in this set. Yeah, and I should say, uh, yeah, the way we did this was we had all five of the decks. We chose the five staff members here at Command Zone that were going to do the upgrades, and then you all kind of figured out amongst yourselves who was going to do what. So this was, it's not like anybody, everyone sort of expressed what they like, maybe their top two 
picks and then hopefully got one of those so you got your top pick i got my top pick and we learned that you and i play rock paper scissors in different ways oh yeah you do it four times i only do it three yeah uh okay well it's not that'll be a whole podcast by itself if we're if we're not careful careful all right uh best cards in the deck considering that on halo is going to be our commander what are the top cards that we know are we're not taking out Yes, the top card that it's the one new card on this, it excites me the most by far. It's this card, Cryptic Pursuit. Oh, you want to read it? Sure. It is two, a blue and a red for an enchantment. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand, manifest the top card of your library, which is put it onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature, and you can turn it face up any time for its mana cost if it is a creature card. It also says, whenever a face down creature you control dies, Exile it if it's an instant or sorcery card. You may cast that card until the end of your next turn. So this is great. I mean, this does all of the things that Unhello wants you to do, in a permanent at least, which is as you cast spells, it gives you fodder for the next sacrifice you're going to make. And every so often that sacrifice is the next spell you're going to cast to trigger it. It, it is an engine unto itself with your commander and spells to sling. Yeah, it seems best friends with on Halo. Uh, yeah, that that that's going to be one of the cards you want to draw the most, I think, when playing this deck, for sure, because it's just going to make the whole thing work. Uh, the the next card you have, the next two cards I'd say that you have on the list are both about copying things, kind of kind of copy payoffs. Uh, Double Vision, three red red for an enchantment. Whenever you cast your first instant or sorcery spell each turn, copy that spell. You may choose new targets for the copy. So this is just adding additional copies. And then Twinning Staff, one of the good reprints in the deck. Three mana for an artifact. If you would copy a spell one or more times, instead, copy it that many times plus an additional time. You may choose new targets for the additional copy. So with on Halo and the casualty, that's making a copy. And now Twinning Staff will be like, oh, you're copying things? I want to do that. And also Twinning Staff, you can pay seven, tap it, copy target instant or sorcery spell you control you may choose new targets for the copy which effectively can be two copies if you weren't otherwise copying something wow that's a lot of copying i hope everybody followed us important thing about double vision just as far as strategy that the deck is pushing you toward both of them are talking about the first one you cast each turn Mm -hmm. so if you're trying to do this in a way where you're casting something on each person's turn in the turn cycle or at least more than just your own uh they're both guiding you toward that strategy which i think is a smart way to do it I think they've they've added that into design to to stop some of these crazy infinite loops you can get into with fork spells copying themselves and then forking themselves again. And if you can only do it on your first one, it kind of can I don't know make that a little bit easier to follow for one and a bit a little bit less infinity. Um, even though you can still go infinite with mm-hmm. some of the stuff. Uh, and the last best card in the deck you've listed here is an oldie but a goodie dig through time six blue blue for an instant has delve so each card you exile from your graveyard while casting this spell uh pays for one colorless or one generic sorry and then you can look at the top seven cards of your library put two of them into your hand and the rest on the bottom of your library in any order boy i want to copy this really bad because you get to go like look at top seven take the best two then look at the next seven take the best two again Yes, you want to copy it bad, and if you have a lot of stuff in your graveyard already, there's a chance that you can copy some splashy sorcery on your own turn and still have the mana up to copy this on another turn in the turn cycle. Uh, Just instant speed, card draw, let alone card draw where you're choosing the best two out of seven, and you're copying it. It's just And you often cast it for two. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Now we've laid down what we think the best cards are, what the reprint value is, all the stats. We're going within Halo. We're about to add the 10 cards that Jamie has picked out to sort of get this thing ready to rumble with real decks uh, as soon as possible. But before we get into that, we got to take a quick break and hear a message from our sponsors. We'll be right back. Okay, it's time for the return of Cool Jimmy. (laughs) What's up, party people? Guess who's back? Wait, is that? Yeah, yeah, you know the dealio. Cool, Josh? Oh, yeah. This Into the Aim shirt's pretty cool. I just wear it because it's comfortable and I like the design. Wow. So effortlessly cool. (gasps) And it's as soft as it looks. Teach me the ways, Cool Josh. How can I be like you? It's easy. Into the AM has tons of awesome t-shirt designs, along with well-made basics like hoodies, joggers, and more. Everything is comfortable and eye-catching, so you're going to feel great whether you're playing Magic or just relaxing at home. They have super fast shipping and hassle-free returns. Plus, right now, they've got a bundle where you can get three graphic tees for just 60 bucks. But actually, Jimmy, I have an extra here if you want to try it. Oh, I'd be honored. Oh, wow. This is nice. Right? Cool, Jimmy? (laughs) That's more like it. 
To take advantage of Into the AM's bundle deal and get an additional 10% off the whole store, visit intotheam.com slash command or click the link in the description. That's 10% off the most comfortable shirts you'll ever wear at intotheam.com slash command. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Ah! Oh, sorry, you scared me. I thought you were an apparition from the future. <laughs> I'm Aerith, Tormented Prophet. Thanks to my prophetic dreams, I'm constantly bombarded with visions of doom and destruction, which is frankly pretty stressful. And you don't have to be a prophet to feel worried about the future. I mean, have you seen the news recently or spent any time on Twitter? Feeling stressed is really normal, but I didn't realize how much stress was affecting my happiness. I kept having headaches, losing sleep, and just feeling anxious all the time. That's why I finally turned to BetterHelp. Talking to a therapist helped lower my stress and improve my quality of life. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy. Give it a try and see if online therapy can help lower your stress. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Command Zone listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash command zone. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash command zone. Whoa, easy there, buddy. Hey guys, it's me, Tatsunari Toad Rider. Now, I love bouncing around on my toad friend, Kami, but I'll say this, the ride is far from smooth. That's why when I want some bops while we hops, I use my Raycon wireless earbuds. Whether I'm listening to frog and roll music or a riveting historical podcast, Raycons deliver top tier audio quality at just half the price of other premium brands. And no matter how choppy the hopping gets, my Raycons never fall out thanks to their optimized gel tips for that perfect in-ear fit. Plus, with their super sleek design, the everyday earbuds look, feel, and sound better than ever. They truly are a croak of genius. And don't worry, with Raycon's eight hours of playtime and 32 hour battery life, my froggy friend can frolic to their heart's content and I'll be listening all the while. Turns out Raycons really are the total package. All right, all right, we'll see ourselves out. Hi ho, Kami! Right now, Command Zone listeners can get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash command. That's buyraycon.com slash command to save 15% on Raycons. Again, buyraycon.com slash command. All right, we're back. We are talking about the Maestro's Massacre pre-con deck. We're doing the budget upgrade guide here with Jamie Block, one of our writers. Okay, we're about to go into the fun part, which is talking about the 10 cards that we are going to suggest people add to this deck to get it up and running. But before we get into that, Jamie, I just want to ask you what your evaluation of the deck was right out of the box and sort of what the goal uh, or what your goals were going into this part of it where you're like, okay, now I'm going to figure out which 10 cards I want to put in. What were you thinking about? Now, my impression of the deck out of the box was, again, I love the commander, but I thought that uh, some aspects of the deck itself just felt a bit clunky. Most notably in the sense of there are a lot more sorceries than there are instants, mm. which doesn't let you take advantage of Von Hello multiple times a turn cycle. And a lot of the fodder that you can recur, which to be fair, there there is a decent amount. There are fun cards that can sort of come back from your graveyard so you can recast them again. But they do require you to keep investing mana in them each time that you want to redeploy them. And it just seems like the deck wants you to have a lot more mana than those eight ramp cards that we talked about are likely to get you to. And Grix so. is not necessarily known for creating a bunch of mana. I mean, usually maybe in one big burst, but like just having a lot of mana on hand. Right. So you wanted to lean into this strategy of like be really being able to activate and get copies of stuff multiple times per turn. I guess not activate, trigger. Yeah, I would love for there to be more instants in it, though, to be honest, a lot of what uh, my includes leaned more toward is just at the very least not having to pay more mana into your fodder. Uh, I think that that helps get you a long way toward uh, you have this hand of instants and sorceries and you don't have to worry about spending additional mana beyond what's in your hand to be able to copy them with your commander. So yeah, a lot it seems of like a good idea. So mana, being more mana efficient will just allow you to do more. Yes, exactly. All right, well, this first one is a good example, I think, of that, and a card that is very powerful. Already uh, $1.80, and it is an uncommon from Strixhaven. Can you guess what it is out there? It is... Stormkiln Artist. 
Three and a red for a 2-2. Two, two. It gets plus one plus zero oh for each artifact you control, but notably, Magecraft, whenever you cast or copy a spell, you create a treasure token. Yep, an instant or sorcery Instant spell. or sorcery spell. Yep. Whenever you cast or copy. Yes. The copy part's easy to miss because I put this in a lot of decks that just can't copy spells at all. But in this deck, holy crap. Yes. The first word that I searched when I saw this deck was Magecraft. Yeah. <laughs> Anything, I know I'm casting a lot of answers for sorceries. And I know that I'm trying to copy all of them. Yep. So just any Magecraft card, but this, it fills that ramp hole that the deck needs to be filled. It's great. Every time that you cast and copy a spell with Unhollow, you're getting two treasures. If you fill the deck with some cheaper stuff or just have drawn the cheaper stuff in the deck... Uh, you are getting two treasures per spell you cast. Maybe that pays for your next spell. Maybe that pays for your next spell. Yeah, you really are now in my lightning bolt example, you would be plus mana. Exactly. So, and that may be, you know, lightning bolt, that's why you said instants are so good because if I was able to, you know, only hold up one mana but had a creature I could sack and I did some stuff on my turn and then it goes to, you know, your turn and now I lightning bolt, get two treasure, I'm, I now have two mana and maybe on... Mel's turn now, I can do something that nets me mana or at least breaks even. And now all of a sudden, with just my one mana, I was able to still cast a spell on everybody's turn and keep that ball rolling, right? Yeah, exactly. It helps It helps build an engine that you don't have to keep adding resources into. Stormkiln Artist, so, so good. All right, the next card you have uh, listed is $2.25. Uh, it is, is it Archmage or Archmage? Depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> I say Arch. Okay. Archmage Emeritus. Two blue blue for a 2-2. Two, two. Human wizard has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, draw a card. Also from Strixhaven. Oh, this is great because just tacking on one draw. Again, I've played this in decks that do not copy uh, spells at all, and it's good. But wow, all of a sudden in that lightning bolt example... Draw two cards for my one mana, kill two things. Man, Lightning Bolt's looking better and better. It's and that's looking like better. The, it's the most modest example I can think of. Just so that if you know that's the floor, what's the ceiling, it's pretty good. Exactly, yeah. No, cards like this enable you to be up on cards, up on mana, from the course of doing what you already wanted to do, which yeah. is exactly where you want to be. All right, what is the next card on the list? The next card is Dika Fractal Theorist. It is four and a blue for a 3-3, three, three, another uh, card that Strixhaven brought us. Uh, it has Magecraft. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, create a 0-0 zero, zero green and blue fractal creature token. Put X plus one plus one counters on it, where X is that spell's mana value. It also has, for three and a blue, target creature token can't be blocked this turn. We don't care about that last part as much, but the fact that when you cast your instant or sorcery spell, you're going to now copy it with Unhalo and make two fractals, which you can use to sacrifice for the casualty from, you know, for the next two casualties. Yes, this is the one that I found that generated fodder, that generated more fodder than you needed right, for the yeah, next turn. More than, you start with one and then you'd have two when you were done. And then if you do it again next turn, you'll have three. Yeah, that's exactly. pretty great. This is where Lightning Bolt fails us, though, because that only costs one, and because the Magecraft, the size of the token that you get, is dependent on the it cost of the spell that you two. cast. It has to be two. So now we want to cast two CMC things, if possible. Okay. That Wow. All right. Sorry, Lightning Bolt. You're out! <laughs> uh, Dika, uh, only 90 cents, so quite, quite a good budget card. This next one is the most expensive card that you have on the entire list, uh, but uh, I know why, and it's mostly the name. It's Shark Typhoon. Five and a blue for an enchantment. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX blue shark creature token with flying where X is that spell's converted mana cost. It also has cycling for one blue and X. Um, so you can discard this card and then draw a card and then you uh, create an XX blue shark creature with token with flying when you cycle it. So if you pay eight mana into this at instant speed, you'll discard a card, draw a card, and make a 6-6 six, six flyer. Uh, not likely to be doing that second one. You're mostly wanting to cast this to kind of do what Dika does in some respect, right? Yeah, you're making another piece of fodder that is dependent on the size of the spell you cast. It's also triggering not just on your instants and sorceries. So if you have drawn into a mana rock, you know, that's giving you fodder for your next instance or sorcery. That's not nothing. I also think 
this card sort of functions in three modes in the deck. There's you hard cast it. Now you have something that's going to make tokens that you can use to sacrifice. There is you cycle it for two because you need to. And there's you cycle it for four. You draw a card and you have a 2-2 that can be the token that you sacrifice for your next instant or sorcery spell. It, it can be a couple of different roles in the deck. Yeah, it replaced itself so it didn't cost you that resource. And then, you know, yeah, you need Sacrifice Fodder. So I think you're going to want to land this, though, cast instance and sorceries and get free Flying Sharks, more or less. And this could even be a win con in the deck after a while. You don't always have to sacrifice. You know, if you have this plus you have uh, Cryptic Pursuit out, then you're definitely going to be netting tokens that are going to live. Or Deke is out, too. And now, you know, one of your win cons maybe becomes remove three or four things, make you know, six tokens, seven tokens. I sacked two of them. Now I got five things. I'm just attacking with the five things that are left over and kind of hoping to win that way. Yeah, going wide with tokens that you get off triggers like this is absolutely a viable win con for the deck. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about the next card on the list, which is Tauran Sky Summoner. Oh, sorry, Shark Typhoon, which we just talked about. $10.60. Yeah, Almost $11. That's crazy. That's a, that's a pretty high price card. I didn't realize it had gotten so high, but... A very cool card in the deck. And Absolutely. Yeah, probably worth it. All right, the next one is Talrand Sky Summoner. Only 20 cents. It is a 2 blue blue for a 2-2. Two, two, and it says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, make a 2-2 two, two flying drake. That's blue. Yes. Did I get that right? I did it from memory. Um, he did do it from memory, and he did get it right. <laughs> <laughs> the, I mean, this one's kind of obvious, but it's along the same lines. I see that you're really prioritizing making the token when you cast the instant or sorcery. Yeah, I, I have a lot of these cards on the list. I did put them all in a row. Uh, and I just think it's important. I think that it's a thing that you really want to sort of have handled on the board. You don't have to be worrying about where am I going to get my sacrifice fodder for on hello. You want to be able to set up a little engine and just go. Right. So now I'm just good. I don't have to worry about the token part. And really, you just need one of these cards on the battlefield. And they're sort of all filling in for each other. Exactly. You yeah. just want to up the odds that you're going to get one of them early enough for it to make sense. And also these two twos having flying in the world where you have gotten more than one of them. Two twos with flying, they aren't going to win you the game quickly but they can definitely chip away and eventually... Be quicker than you think. I mean, I have a Drake Haven in my Shorakai deck and very often it wins by just having seven Drakes. It's just like 14 in the air. What are you going to do? You know, stop my other stuff from happening, 14 in the air. Then the third time you have 14 in the air, they're dead. Like, that's it. Yeah. Okay, uh, the next one is... We have Poppet Stitcher, a relatively recent card. Uh, it is two and a blue for a two, three human wizard. It says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, create a two, two black zombie creature token with decayed. It also has a backside at the beginning of your upkeep. If you have three or more tokens, you can transform it. It becomes a factory. We're never going to do that. We uh, just want the two twos. We just want the two twos, and we don't care about decayed because we are sacrificing them anyway. I like this one because it's three mana. Whereas Talrand is four mana, Shark Typhoon is six mana, Dika is five mana. This one, now obviously our commander is three mana, so it's not gonna come out the same turn, but mm -hmm. you could conceivably go Pop It Stitcher, one mana spell on the turn after you play on Halo and already start to get your engine going, right? Yeah, exactly. You play one or the other on turn three, and then you play the other and you're one mana spell. Great if it's a one mana cantrip, doesn't need to be. Uh, and then you're going, you're off to the races at that point. And I can stack these triggers, right? So when I cast my instant spell, let's say I cast Brainstorm here, not That you bolt. can't do. Oh, so you can't- Casualty is an as you cast. Ah, so, th so I would cast, get this zombie, do my Brainstorm, but not be able to copy it with an Halo. And then the next turn, I'd have the zombie to start that going. Yes. Got it. There are a few two-drop, two-power creatures in the deck. Dream scenario, you've played one of those on turn two. But no, none of these things that make tokens when you cast let you sacrifice them to casualty in that moment. Oh, That's it's important when to know. you cast. Got it. So it's not a... Okay. Yep. Interesting. All right. The next uh, card on your list. Oh, sorry. Pop It Stitcher. I always forget to say the price. $3.70. Yeah. So reasonable, but one of the sort of, I guess, higher end cards. Um, all right. The next one is Jadar, Ghoul Caller of Nefalia. One in a black for a 1-1 one, one human wizard. At the beginning of your end step, if you control no creatures with Decay to create a 2-2 two, two black zombie creature token with Decay. Ah, this is even better because you can play it on turn two, just what you were talking about, right? It makes that Decay creature. Then on three, you play on Halo. Then on four, you're ready to go. Yeah, this the moment you add it, I feel that this becomes the best two drop in the deck. 
It's just, it's going to give you at least one piece of fodder every turn cycle. The deck does have a few cards around four mana that are good card draw spells that if you can just go Jadar into Commander into one of those, like Factor Fiction. Oh, double Factor Fiction? Double Factor Fiction turn four. And it'll create the zombie for the next turn. Exactly. Because you won't have it at your end step anymore. That seems pretty sweet. Yeah, I just think this is great. It's just a very good to be able to start your engine on the second turn. I like it. Uh, that card is only 80 cents. Mm -hmm. The next one up we have is Lear, Disciple of the Drowned. It is three blue blue. Uh, it is a human wizard. It is a three four. And it says spells can't be countered. But more importantly, it says each instant and sorcery card in your graveyard has flashback. The flashback cost is equal to that card's mana cost. Uh, so it's a pre-con. And I also think uh, a deck that's about copying spells, counter spells generally not good to copy. So it, does, it doesn't have a lot of counter spells. It's not likely that you're going to want to put a bunch in there. So the spells can't be countered doesn't really hurt you. And now we just get to basically have all the, the instances and sorceries that are in our graveyard sort of act as if they're in our hand. Yeah, exactly. It really diminishes the chance that you're going to run out of spells to cast and copy with Unhello by giving you access to all of the ones that you have cast so far. Yeah, would you like to cast all your instants and sorceries twice? Yes, I would. Thank you. And then copy them every time I cast them. That's like casting them four times. Exactly. Four, two, and then four. Yeah. You cast a cheap instant on your turn. The next turn, you cast it again. You copy it both times. Oh, that's pretty sweet. Uh, the next one is Siphon Mind. Oh, man. This is a little brutal, actually. <laughs> yeah, it is. No, that's fine. Oh, sorry. Lier, Disciple of the Drowned, was the, most, the second most expensive card you put on the list at $7. Yes. Uh, Siphon Mind, the next card, is only $1. It is three and a black for a sorcery. Each other player discards a card. You draw a card for each discard card discarded this way. So this reads four mana, sack a two you know two power creature or, or more. Everybody discards two cards and you and you draw six. Yes, you Whew. had better be ready for the hate that you are going to receive <laughs> if you go Jadar into Unhello into Siphon Mind on turn four, but. On the other hand, you will be ready for the hate you'll receive because you'll have drawn six cards and everyone else will have discarded two. I mean, you're up 12 cards on the table because they all lost six and you gained six. So, you know, the, the gap widened pretty big. Yeah, oh, that's, yeah, that's nice. It's pretty brutal. Uh, and then the last card, card number 10. It sounds like an innocuous one, but these type of cards actually tend to be the best to copy. We have Unexpected Windfall from AFR. It's two red red for an instant. As an additional cost to cast it, discard a card, but then draw two cards and create two treasure tokens. Now, if you copy this, draw four cards, create four treasure tokens, it's mana neutral. You've drawn four cards and you have the mana up for your next turn. If you want to cast another instant, it's, a, it's essentially paid for. And you don't have to discard an additional card when you copy things like this, because this is part of the cost of the spell. When you copy a spell, you're not paying its cost again. Exactly. So what you will do is you will draw four cards and discard one of them. I mean, that's not exactly how it works, but yes, you'll be up uh, two cards rather than card even. Because mm -hmm. if you say, oh, I cast Unexpected Winds will fall, I discard a card, I've used two cards, and I draw two cards. But now I draw two more cards, and I don't have to discard for the copy, so I'm up two. Yeah, um, you're in good shape. Uh, this card, by the way, is only 50 cents. And also, just to sort of throw in a bonus honorable mention, there's a new card from SNC, and obviously we don't know the prices of these cards at the time that we're uh, building these deck upgrades, so we can't include it, but it is called Big Score. It is the exact same card for a less restrictive cost. It is three and a red. And probably we will be less expensive just because it's newer, although this is from uh, Midnight Hunt, so unexpected. There's a lot of cards like this, though, that are kind of rummaging plus create treasures that become so good when you copy because you don't have to discard that extra card. And the treasures, when you're doubling, imagine if you have double vision out or something. Now it's like draw six, discard one, create six treasure tokens. Again, yeah. you can get into the realm where you're actually up mana when you cast these things. Exactly. Any of these cards that become sort of neutral in some way when you copy them once just become crazy when you copy them more than once. Uh, okay, so we've got our 10 cards here. If you're a patron, by the way, you have access to our show notes, which lists all the cards out. I'll read them one more time just so you can grab them. Uh, it's Stormkiln Artist, Arc Archmage Emeritus, Dika Frac Fractal Theorist, Shark Typhoon, Talrand, Sky Summoner, Poppet Stitcher, Jadar, Ghoul Caller of Nefalia, Lier, Disciple of the Drowned, Siphon Mind, and Unexpected Windfall. Jamie, you've done this all for a total price 
of $28.75. Come on down. I have. You know, wanted to get close to that 30. It's like yep. any government agency. You have to use the funding you get or they're going to cut it next year. Yeah, if you don't spend your money, then you're, well, they won't give you as big a budget next year. Exactly. Um, so that's nice. But let's talk about the honorable mentions. You had three cards here that didn't make the cut for whatever reason. The first one, two of them, I'm assuming just because price. Yes. Let's talk about Coligan's Command. Coligan's Command. One black red for an instant. Choose two. Mode one. Return target creature card from your graveyard to hand. Mode 2, target player discards a card. Mode 3, destroy target artifact. Mode 4, it deals 2 damage to any target. So this is probably returning stuff if you need creatures for that reason. And then, remember, you're probably copying this. So destroying 2 artifacts, mm -hmm. discarding 2 cards, you know, dealing 2 damage to something twice, you know, maybe able to kill something bigger. Yeah, it's versatile. In a pinch, if you're not copying it, you can get back the thing that would let you start copying stuff again. And you can even sacrifice something in order to copy it. And if you're already choosing the mode of getting something back from the, gra from the graveyard, get back the thing that you just sacrificed. Ah, uh, with the copy, that's nice. Yeah, and it's just an instant that is versatile and cheap, so you're upping the odds of being able to cast multiple stuff in a turn cycle. It is a $10 card, however. It so. is also $10. There's yeah. also that. <laughs> uh, here's a card, though, that made the honorable mention list, and it's only 10 cents. Did you do that on purpose? Here's $10. Here's 10 cents. Kind of. Okay. I wanted to show that, it. you know, there are some very budget options if you're just looking to up the instant count. All right. It's called Startle. It's one in a blue for an instant. Target creature gets negative 2, negative 0 until end of turn. Create a 2-2 two -two black zombie creature token with decayed, and then draw a card. Oh, uh, this is great. Creates the fodder. If you copy it, you'll draw two cards when you do it. Actually, that negative two, negative O could matter, right? I've, I, those cards tend to overperform a little bit. You save you some life. Let's imagine it said uh, gain four life, create the two, two, two twos, right? And then mm -hmm. draw, draw two cards for two mana. Yeah, that would be great. Pretty efficient. Yeah, even on turn two, you don't hate casting that. Just if it is so that you know you'll have fodder for the first spell that you do get to cast after you play your commander. Oh, really good point. Because, it, yeah, it draws you the card. So it doesn't really matter if that was your only two drop. You're just like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm set up for on Halo. And, yeah, I just got to get past that turn make my 2-2 for free. Okay, let's talk about the third honorable mention here. $9 card, Lim Dole's Vault. Blue and a black for an instant. Look at the top five cards of your library. As many times as you choose, you may pay one life. Put those cards on the bottom of your library in any order. Then look at the top five cards of your library. Then shuffle your library and put the last cards you looked at this way on top of it in any order. You look at five, you don't like it. You look at the next five, you don't like it. You look at the next five, you don't like it. You look at the next five, you've now paid four life. And you go, I like these five. I'm going to put them back on top of my library in any order. It's kind of a weird tutor, but it can also tutor for multiple things, right? It can kind of find, it's hard to find exactly combo pieces because they'd have to be in the same five card, uh, within five cards of each other in mm -hmm. your deck. But you can be like, oh, this one has you know, a ramp spell and a card draw spell in the five, and I would, I'm would i going to draw the ramp first, and then I'm going to draw the card draw, and, you know, whatever. I get to put those in whatever order I want. Exactly. This card, you don't really care so much about copying. In fact, yeah, it doesn't do a lot of good to copy it. Yeah, in fact, please don't. <laughs> but it just being in, in a sort of tutor at instant speed, uh, it just felt like a thing that this deck would want to do. Uh, certainly finding finishers, especially if you're working with something that is still mostly the pre-con build, there's a few cards in there that are really your big finishers and being able to dig to them quickly with one card that you can deploy as a surprise just seems like a great option. The problem with Limdol's Vault, I'm just going to warn everybody, is it takes a long time to resolve because there's a lot of things to weigh in your head. So you look at five cards and you got to think like, is if there's not a certain card I'm looking for that I'm just looking for generally kind of a good five cards and it's like, can I do better than this one? And you end up sitting there and thinking about it for a minute and then doing it a few times and it can often take a couple of minutes. So just be careful. It's best to sort of know what you're looking for when you cast that spell. Exactly. All right, let's talk about the 10 cards we got to take out because if we're going to add 10 cards, then well, we got to make room for them. This usually involves some amount of understanding what the deck wants to do or what we have too many sort of redundant pieces for. What is the first card we're uh, removing from the deck? The first card that we're cutting is Squee the Immortal. Poor Squee. Poor Squee. He was not immortal in this context. This is the uh, one red red one for a uh, two one. You may cast Squee the Immortal from your graveyard or from exile. So you can always just cast Squee as a three mana two one. 
Seems expensive. It seems expensive. Usually squeeze good in a deck that's going to somehow create some sort of infinite mana loop. And then it's going to like perforce you to death or something weird in that way. And this deck's probably not going to do that. It's probably not going to do that. You probably don't want to pay an extra three on top of the cost of the spell that you want to copy. No, and then have that's to just do like, that. may as well just cast another spell. The copying is not, you know, it's not a good deal in that instance. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the next one is a little bit similar, but also a little different. It's Blood Soaked Champion. You want to read it? Sure. It is one black for a 2-1 that can't block and has raid. Pay one and a black. Returned Blood Soaked Champion from your graveyard to the battlefield. Activate only if you attack this turn. Now... I don't think this deck is always going to have the best attacks. Mm. So not only do you have to pay more mana to get back your fodder each time you want to do it, I think sometimes it will end up stranded in your graveyard, and especially in the early game, you're in a position where, oh, would I have to attack with my commander and just hope that they don't like that block in order to get it back? I mean, there's a 1-3 with Death Touch, so it might be okay, but still, at the same point, it's risky. You don't know that every game you're going to be able to do it. It is risky. There's another card that's in the deck, Skyclave Shade, that is sort of the same thing, except it's a landfall trigger to be able to get it back. I feel like you're much more likely to be able to hit your land drops than you are to have good attacks. Yeah, it makes sense. Also, you added a whole bunch of cards that sort of give us some sort of sacrifice fodder when we cast our instants and sorceries. So it makes sense to be cutting, you know, this... Uh, stuff that's not on an instant or sorcery, right? These are creatures that cost mana. It's like you said. I mean, you are tried to create the deck so that it's going to make the fodder for free mm-hmm. as a one-time investment rather than investing over and over in these uh, squee and blood-soaked champion type cards. Yes. All right. The next card is Cyrix, Carrier of the Flame. This is the Phoenix Tribal Legendary creature that honestly like doesn't have a lot of synergies in the deck. You're not having creatures leave uh, your graveyard that much, and we just removed two that would. Yes, we just removed two of the cards that would, uh, which is why I ordered them in this way, so you would further understand why I'm taking this out, but also we're just not Phoenix Tribal. Right, so it just it doesn't fit with what we're trying to do. Probably, good, you know, this is good and fun if you're going to take it out and build a deck around it, but it doesn't necessarily belong in this deck. Exactly. All right, the next card is a vehicle, Smuggler's Buggy. Four mana for a 5-5 five, five vehicle has Hideaway 4, And it says, whenever Smuggler's Buggy deals combat damage to a player, you may cast the exiled card, the hideaway card, without paying its mana cost. If you do, return Smuggler's Buggy to its owner's hand so that uh, you could cast it in hideaway again, I guess. It has crew two. This this is weird. It doesn't do anything with... This is just a cool card somebody designed and was like, where should we put it? Yeah, I can see the play pattern they're looking for where you play this, you hide away an instant or sorcery, you get through with it, you get to cast it for free, so it doesn't matter that you had to pay mana to get your fodder back in the original construction, and then you return it to your hand and do it again. It has no haste, it has no evasion. If it had one of those two things, it would at least be a stronger contender, but it just feels like a lot of the time it is going to sit on your battlefield, making you pine for the card that you have hid away under it. Four mana, play it, does nothing. Just like real hard to do these days in Commander, right? Like yeah. four mana, play it, and then just hope and pray that you can connect with it. And it does like even if it wasn't a vehicle, it was a creature that had hideaway and attacked. But no, like you also have to crew this thing. It's just a lot of downsides. I don't know. Yeah, it's a lot of hurdles and then it bounces back. So yes, you can do it again, but that also means you have to pay for it again. Yeah. Makes sense. All right, what's the next one? The next one is Spellbinding Soprano, another new card. It is one and a red for a 2-2 human bard. It says, whenever it attacks, instant sorcery spells you cast this turn cost one less to cast. It also has Encore for three and a red. So it's a two-mana 2-2. It's something you can play the turn before you cast your commander and then sacrifice afterward. Then you can Encore it. But the Encore, to me, just didn't quite synergize with what the deck wants to do. At least in my mind, you're getting your best value not when you cast a ton of big instants or sorcery spells in one turn, which is what that Encore encourages you to do, but when you're doing something each turn, it just feels like it's not the most efficient use of your mana. And again, I've added a lot of stuff that makes 2-2 token fodder, so a lot of the things that I cut were the things that were the pre-existing fodder that just felt a little more mana intensive. It's interesting because Encore 4... And then you attack with it, and you get negative. You get three uh, 
a three mana discount on your instants and sorceries. Yeah, it didn't pay for itself the first no, time. No, you paid four already. So if your plan is to get out one big thing, you may as well just not encore it and use that four mana on the thing. So you have to like cast multiple instants and sorceries for that three mana discount to really pay off, right? Because if, if I have th three four mana things and I can cast all three of them because they only cost like one blue, one red, you know, one black or whatever because of the discount. But then I can only copy one of those because of Unhalo. So yeah, it just kind of it's it's interesting because it does say instant and sorcery, but when you think about it, it does kind of fight your normal play patterns of what you want to do. Yeah, I think that the best value you're going to get out of this card is if you play it on turn two, and that there's just someone who doesn't really have a board, and you can keep attacking into them and getting that discount early on. And it's something you can sack and feel fine about it on turn four once Unhalo's out because you can encore it out later and the. Things you encore can be also sacked. So, but like we said, you've taken out you, or you've added in so much stuff that solves the problem of what am I going to sack that you maybe don't need a creature like this. Exactly. All right. The next one is determined iteration, one and a red for an enchantment. At the beginning of combat on your turn, populate. The token created this way gains haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Wow. Weird, weird card. Weird card. Card weird. In red? Yeah, red red populates now a little. Red makes hasty things that then disappear. But this deck does not really make tokens that are that much more impressive than a two two. Yeah, you so, want to get to populate my decayed zombie? Yeah. Now, to be fair, the next card, spoiler, is probably the one card that they were thinking of. Actually, the next two cards are probably the cards they were thinking of when they put this in the deck. Well, it makes sense if you're going to cut those, then you would definitely cut this. Then I would definitely cut this. Yeah, but this wants to be in a deck that's going to make a token copy of something scary, not a 2-2 two -two or a 1-1. One -one. It's going to like create a clone token copy of something on the battlefield. Yeah. Like a, yeah. I think this card is super interesting in a deck that is going to have tokens with powerful ETB or leaves the yeah. battlefield synergies, but I think just creating either more 2-2s two to sacrifice or more big tokens to try to beat down with, it's just, too often it's just going to end up being a dead card. This is a cool card because it's only two mana, so I can see it getting some use uh, in the right deck, but this is not the right deck for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry, Determined Iteration, you're out. Sorry. All right. Next up, we have, as I teased, Call the Skybreaker. Five and then two is it hybrid mana, so seven total for a sorcery. Create a five, five blue and red elemental creature token with flying. And it has retrace. Retrace means you can cast this spell from your graveyard by discarding a land. Is that correct? Yes. But you still got to pay seven mana. You still have to pay seven mana every time you do it for a 5-5. Five five. They put this card in a lot of commander decks. I have no idea why. It's a bad card because you don't want to be playing, paying seven mana for a 5-5. Five five. And yes, yes, you can copy it by sacrificing something, but seven mana for two 5-5s five is still not even that great. Yes, they have flying. I get it. But seven mana. Seven. You just, for most of the game, it's sitting there and you can't even cast it. Yeah, it's sitting in your hand and... If the premise of what we're doing here is to upgrade this deck to be able to compete at a more competitive table, wow, is this not a card that is going to compete at a more competitive table? Two 5-5 five, five flyers in the air that it costs you seven mana to get, you are going to be behind. You're gonna, you'll probably lose. Like, here's what's going to happen. You're going to be like, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make two 5-5s five, in the air, and I have to totally tap out to do that so I have no way to interact. And then the thing they do with their seven mana is like, you know something extremely powerful they play thousand year storm or something and you're like crap i could have countered that or whatever but no now yes i hit them for 10 and then they just cast 57 spells on their next turn or whatever mm -hmm. so yeah not powerful enough the next one is similar reign of the pits for black black for a sorcery each player sacrifices a creature create an xx black demon creature token with flying where x is the total power of the creature sacrifice this way you've got sacrifice fodder so you're thinking hey it's not going to hurt me very much Maybe I get a, I don't know, 10-10 out of it. 12-12. It's possible. 15-15. The, the thing about this card is, if this card said each opponent, I would be in on this card. But it doesn't. So you've sacrificed one thing to copy it, let's say. Oh, now if you, you need choose two to other that, things. Now you need to sacrifice two other things in addition to everyone else. The odds of this, you're already way ahead if you are in a position where you can sacrifice three things and it doesn't affect you. Mm. I just think that you are likely to end up in a situation where this card is in your hand and you realize that if you cast it, you might be losing an engine piece yourself. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. All right. There are two more cards to go. Yes. This we, next one's a removal spell. It is a removal spell. 
Go ahead you can say it. that about it. Yep. <laughs> it is sever the bloodline. It is three and a black for a sorcery. Exile target creature and all other creatures with the same name as that creature. And it has flashback for five black black. It's too inefficient, right? It's just too inefficient. It's just too expensive. As a sorcery. If it was an instant, I think you could think about it. Because then you could play it on the other player's turns and do the thing you were talking about where I get an additional, um, you know, uh, trigger off my commander, an additional copy. Mm -hmm. Even then, there are so many two mana removal spells in black. Yes, they don't maybe exile, and sometimes that's very relevant, but just four mana sorcery should be doing something big, should be doing something like Siphon Mind. Yeah. Flashback for five black, black. You're never going to do that. Seven mm -hmm. mana. Uh, and the last card we're going to cut from the deck is Zinder Split's Judgment, four and a blue for a sorcery. Each player, for each player, choose friend or foe. Each friend creates a token that's a copy of a creature they control. Each foe returns a creature they control to its owner's hand. So this is pretty interesting if you copy it. They'll all have to bounce two things they get to choose, though. And then you'll make two tokens that are copies of something you have. Right. The, the ceiling on what this can do is actually quite high. Like if you create two tokens that are a copy of one of your things that makes tokens and your opponents are set back considerably by having to bounce two things, you're in a very good position. It's just the fact that that second thing gives them the choice of what they return. Yeah. Is, it's another card where you are maybe making enemies not at the pace that you are ready to keep up with, considering that someone is going to have two tokens they don't care about or... Uh, a creature that they want to play again to get the ETB or something. Yeah, like really good point, actually. It can easily bounce, like, their Moldrifter or something. And they're like, oh, well, that was too bad. Yeah, <laughs> and you can't even get around it by making them a friend because that is still them getting a copy of something. Yeah, so they'll just be like, <laughs> okay, then in that case, I'll just clone my Moldrifter. <laughs> yes, I have also found it is dangerous to call people your foe in a commander game. <laughs> it often makes it feel like you're the arch enemy for some reason. Oh, interesting psychology there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so those are the 10 cards that we would take out of the deck and to make room for the 10 that we talked about earlier. Jimmy, do you want to talk about how this deck plays? Yeah. You want to build an engine so that you can just keep going through your spells, playing spells that draw you more, until you get to some big finishers. A lot of the sort of pre-con inclusive big finishers will involve you winning with a big army of tokens that you should already be building along the way. But that's pretty much the way to go. Just play things that keep the value flowing, uh, ways where you don't have to play mana into it again, uh, and just keep building until you have a token army that can win. Yeah, if you get one of the sort of Shark Typhoon or Dikas or Talrans out, that's going to accelerate the speed at which you can go now because every time you cast an instant or sorcery, you're getting the means by which to copy it. And now you, you sort of get the second one and now you're netting tokens. And that, I think, you know, you remove stuff, you draw cards with your instants and sorceries, you keep the board under control, and you're advancing your board by when you do that by creating those extra tokens and that's kind of what wins you the game probably yeah exactly everything you're doing whether it's drawing yourself cards making yourself mana destroying your opponent's creatures is giving you some additional advantage beyond what it says on the card because of some cards you've already played yeah and don't forget you're doing all the things you're doing twice so even like you know brainstorm or something becomes you know draw extra cards and if you're making two twos every time you do that, now you're making two two twos, and before you know it, like that's that's like extra value on instants and sorceries and extra tokens, and yeah, that's gonna short, add up fairly quickly. Yeah, you just want a snowball. Yep. All right, to the listeners, what do you think of the Maestro's Massacre's pre-con? Any cards we missed? Anything you think we just have to add to this deck that we didn't talk about? Or any cards we suggested that you should take out that you're like, no, 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 that has to stay in the deck? Let us know in the comments on Twitter. You can email us. If you're on our Discord, you're a Patreon. Uh, you can definitely let us know there as well. I and would actually add one question yeah. if you want to let us know. I think this commander can pull you in two directions. You can either want to cast a lot of instants on every turn or just build and copy some big, huge, splashy things. Which would you try to do? Mm. I would definitely try to do it on every turn because this, that's going to keep your curve low. And these days, you got to be able to interact, which usually is uh, you need a few mana left over to be able to hold open your, you know, whatever your bounce spell is or your lightning bolt, as I say. I think mm -hmm. lightning bolt probably does go in, honestly. It's just so efficient. We'll have to duel with different on Hello decks, one with lightning bolt and one without. No other cards different. <laughs> you can always also like put Fury Storm or something in and try to win with your lightning bolt eventually. That's true. Uh, okay. 
if you want to get your hands on the Maestro's Massacre pre-con or all the pre-cons or any of the pre-cons or a draft booster, collector's booster, set booster, anything from Streets to New Capenna, channelfireball.com slash command. That's the place to go. You know you're a Magic player. You're going to order Magic cards no matter what we say. If you just use our affiliate link, when you do, you are getting the cards you need for your deck to upgrade it or whatever, but you are simultaneously supporting the content that you enjoy. We really appreciate everybody that goes to channelfireball.com slash command. You really do, do help keep the lights on around here. And then, of course, once you get your hands on these cards, you don't want anything to happen to them. You want them to stay in good condition, and you want them to look awesome. I mean, I think a lot of us play the game... Uh, to, you know, have a nice theme to really express ourselves, to have good versions of the cards that we like. And Ultra Pro really fits into that. And then they make really high quality products to protect your stuff, but also just good looking stuff. Their playmats look better than anybody else's. Their sleeves have all the art from the actual set. Yeah, they, they have sweet dice, the Eclipse dice, the new uh, Eclipse dice I really, really like because they're so clean and clear and easy to see. So Ultra Pro really does make the best stuff to protect all of your game pieces. Can't recommend them highly enough. Okay. Now it's time for the end step where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic. I see you've got written something down here, Jamie. What is it? I have written down Disco Elysium. Which is a video game. It is a video game. I've heard you and Jordan talking about this thing for a while. I haven't had a chance to try it out yet. You want to explain uh, what it is to everybody out there if they haven't heard of it? Sure. It's very much a writer's video game, which is the reason you've heard Jordan and I talking about it. <laughs> it is developed by a novelist sort of based on the world of his novels. It's just... Honestly, one of the reasons it might not be the best end step, go in not knowing much about it. Oh. It's that kind of game. But I will say this, it is some of my favorite writing I've ever encountered, full stop. Not just not in just games, game, but TV, movies, books, film. Film is the same as movies. <laughs> the writing in the game is better than that. <laughs> well, it's, uh, I haven't played it, but I've seen headlines and I've heard people talking about it. And that is sort of the main critique that everybody has of the game it's just the writing and the storytelling in it is so so good can you tell us anything at all about like genre or anything yeah, like that you're sort of in a noir detective type world uh and you start the game with essentially full amnesia so you don't even know what the world that you're in is which mm. is a cool storytelling device and you I have to learn you have to learn and as you learn these 24 different elements of your own psyche are talking to you and berating you and suggesting crazy conspiracy theories. Uh, and it's all, uh, as of a couple of years ago, where they sort of had a new special edition come out, fully voice acted, and the voice acting is incredible. Now, you know... So it's an experience. It's an experience. Uh, a lot of people's object objections to very wordy games is, I don't want to have to do all that reading. You don't have to. You can do all that listening. And ah, it's beautiful. He said that for me because I don't like uh, all the reading cutscenes. I skip everything in games. So maybe if I, yeah, if it's, if it's just like an audio podcast, I can listen to that. I do that all the time. Yeah. The main voice of your psyche is this jazz musician with just an incredible voice. If nothing else, look up a trailer that has that voice in it. See if it's for you. Is it like a mystery or am I trying to... I guess you must be trying to figure out who you are and like why you forgot stuff. Yes, it is a mystery. I will spoil that for you. You are a detective. Okay. You are trying to solve a case. The All game right. centers around you trying to solve the case. It's a noir, so that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. That's you don't want to give anything else away. I don't want to give anything <laughs> else away. Enjoy the writing. It is. It really is an experience. It it twists the structure of storytelling in a way that I haven't seen much media do. Period. Let alone a video game. It is in my opinion, the game that is the best argument for video games are art. Oh, wow. Very cool. Is it uh, PC or is it cardboard? It's everything. Okay. Disco Elysium. It's everything. Play it on your Switch. Play it in bed. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, big thanks to our amazing team here at the Command Zone. Arthur Meadowcroft, Shauna Gillis, Damon Lenz, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Grav Gorlotti, Truck Tie, Evan Limberger, Mitch Trafford, and of course, sitting beside me, Jamie Block. Thanks for doing this uh, pre-con upgrade guide for everybody out there. Let us know how uh, your pre-con does when you when you get into action with those quote-unquote real decks. I've been amazed lately how good pre-cons can be just with like 10 cards like this added in. They can often like do just fine, and I've seen them win games at our tables in our playgroup. So. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Just internal testing we've done, goldfishing and otherwise with these decks. Very impressive. Yeah, the Wizards have gotten really good at these pre-cons and 
you know, building them to a good level. You can still improve them, but it's not like they don't do anything when you play them out of the box. They do their thing. Okay. Special thanks to Jeffrey Palmer for the living card animations that start and begin uh, our show. This, yeah, he did this one days and you can find Jeff- Jeffrey on Twitter at living cards, MTG. All right, everybody, everybody, we've got uh, more pre-con upgrade guides. We've got set reviews of Streets of New Compenna for the next few weeks. We are definitely going to be diving deep into every nook and cranny of this set. So make sure you hit that notification button. Make sure you subscribe, all the rest of that good stuff. And uh, we will see you very, very soon. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs>